Thanks very much for the uh, in invitation. Uh, and I'm going to build on uh, what we've just heard about um, um, some of the uh, output from NIHR, because they're actually uh, funding me as well. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, a little bit about transplantation. I'm afraid I'm going to have to introduce some immunology into this uh, uh, morning, and I'll try and be as, as simplistic about that as possible. And I'm going to talk about how we can add genes into cells to change their properties and make them either more useful or correct a particular disorder. And then, as mentioned, I'm going to touch on gene editing uh, using not actually CRISPRs, but talons in the first instance. And I'll talk about the first application uh, in uh, man of uh, a, a gene edited cell product, which we undertook uh, not so long ago. Now, uh, by means of background, uh, I'm based at uh, Great Ormond Street, which is just a few blocks from here. And it's uh, closely integrated with the Institute of Child Health. Geographically, it's the same campus where we're linked by a single corridor. It's part of UCL. And it provides a very uh, useful environment for taking new treatments and developments into, into trials. So um, my own speciality revolves around transplantation of stem cells in bone marrow. And that's done by collecting um, uh, from a, a volunteer, a healthy donor. Usually, historically, it was always done like this, collecting from the hip bone, uh, a collection of uh, bone marrow and anesthetic. More recently, in the last sort of 15 years or so, we've been collecting stem cells from peripheral blood using special machines. And uh, we've also been using stem cells that we can take from cord blood after the delivery of a, of a placenta, otherwise a waste product, but now being banked quite extensively for use in transplantation. So we undertake around about 100 of these procedures a year. And overall, in children, the outcomes are pretty good. They're around about 80% long-term survivals, but uh, really relies on being able to have a good match between your uh, donation and your patient. And transplantation really is about getting uh, one particular group of cells into the new patient, into the patient's new marrow and, uh, and, and reconstituting, recovering the whole of the immune system. And we see on the left here, we've got um, these uh, stem cells that need to engraft. And this is the key part of any transplant. It's if you get these in and they take hold in the patient, they can produce all the other cells, the red cells, the platelets, and in particular, a group of cells called T cells. And T cells are the uh, orchestrators of our immune response, you really can't manage without these because they've got very powerful, very strong antivirus, antipathogen effects. They're the same cells that you heard in, earlier on that are targeted by the HIV virus and are knocked out in, in HIV infection. They've got very useful anti-cancer effects for some types of cancer, in particular the blood leukemias and lymphomas. And in terms of transplantation, we really need to get these cells in because they help protect the graft and stop it being rejected by the host. But everything um, uh, is not quite so straightforward because these are the very same cells that will cause us problems with something called graft versus host disease if they're not well matched. And it's this that stops us in uh, the transplantation field. So uh, at our institution over the last uh, 15 years or so, we've built up an expertise in engineering both stem cells and T cells because there's an opportunity in these procedures where the cells are ex vivo, outside the body. So that's an ideal time to take them to a laboratory, a clean room facility, and to uh, change them. And for some time, we've been uh, uh, developing reagents using disabled viruses to add genes into these cells. And we've built a whole expertise around that. We've worked with the regulators in the UK, the MHRA and other bodies, ethics bodies and so on, to determine how we can take these treatments into new therapies. We've got clean rooms and facilities, expertise in manufacturing cells. And probably most importantly, we can now deal with uh, the, the logistics of collecting something from a patient, bringing it to the laboratory, engineering it, freezing it if necessary, and getting it back to that patient in a timely manner. So with all of that in place, uh, we're, we're set to take some of the new uh, developments into um, early phase trials. And over the last uh, five or six years, this story has been hitting uh, headlines, in particular in North America, where they've been ahead of the curve in getting them into a clinic. This is about engineering those immune cells I mentioned, T cells, to be powerful anti-leukemic 
um, soldiers, if you like. And it's done by introducing new receptors into their, uh, into their cell surface that can recognize very specifically different types of leukemia. And when they, when they get the signal, uh, this example here is showing a leukemia showing, uh, show, uh, with a marker called 19 on it. When they get the signal, they release these chemicals and they kill the tumor cell. And the remarkable thing is these particular cells can um, kill one after another after another of their targets. So a single cell can kill many fold tumor cells. And in particular for the uh, blood cancers, this has turned out to be a very effective way of uh, dealing with these types of conditions. And it has been described as a, as a breakthrough in science. Uh, um, uh, this is a 2013's uh, uh, cover page for Science Breakthrough of the Year. Um, now, the, the concept here has been relatively straightforward in terms of uh, collecting cells from a patient, taking them to the laboratory, engineering them, getting them back to that patient, and we've been able to do that for some time. But of course, the problem here is these patients have already been through rounds and rounds of chemotherapy, their blood counts have been hit quite hard, and any cells we collect uh, may not be as fit as they would be from an otherwise healthy individual. So if we can't collect cells from the patient, what are we going to do? Well, we look for a well-matched um, volunteer donor, and that's a possibility. But again, the logistics of it are one collection, one set of manufacturing back to one patient. It's not really scalable on the, um, on, uh, to do with the size of the uh, um, underlying market. So there's uh, new attempts to generate um, um, a product that can be given to multiple recipients collected from a single donor, and that involves introducing the gene editing and the knockout steps that maybe allow us to do that. And so with this in mind, um, for, the, uh, for the last uh, few years, there's been all sorts of reagents being developed, and every single issue of a, uh, a scientific journal that you pick up is now describing gene editing tools and the improvements in those tools over the last few years has been incredible. And in, um, in summary, there's three platforms that have really come to the fore. Zinc finger nucleases have been around for uh, 15 years or more. Um, talons have been around for five or six years. And over the last three or four years, CRISPR has come to the fore. And what all of these do is essentially guide very uh, precise enzymes to sites in the genome where they create a double-stranded DNA break. And the cell then tries and repairs that. And as it does, it usually knocks out the function of that gene. And that's the simplest application of these tools so far. But there's all sorts of challenges. We have to get these reagents into cells. We have to get them into all the cells we want to affect. We have to understand what other effects might be happening away from the target sites we're particularly interested in. And so how to apply them hasn't been entirely straightforward in the uh, clinical context. But T cells turn out to be a, a very uh, useful arena to test some of these reagents. So come back to a bit of immunology, T cells have something on them called a T cell receptor. They have molecules on them that are uh, distinguishing them as uh, individual for a particular uh, patient and all sorts of other markers. This one I've labeled CD52 because it's relevant to our story here. And so what we've been able to do for some time is use disabled viruses. In fact, the disabled viruses we use have been directly derived from the technology we've understood from the 30 years of uh, unraveling of the HIV story. So that's uh, another part of that story. And we can use those viruses to add into our cell the genetic code to arm them against our leukemia. And that's the story we've shown on the front cover of the science paper a few slides ago. But now we go further than that. We use the gene editing steps to take this off, that's the T cell receptor, and to take this other molecule off, CD52. So these cells are now impotent against anything other than the leukemia, and they're invisible to some of the very strong antibody therapy we give to the patients to uh, get these grafts in. So with that um, process uh, uh, developed in the laboratory, in 2015, we worked with a company called Selectis, it's a French biotech company, to take these steps into a full-scale manufacturing uh, production run in our facility at Gosh. And to give you some idea of the uh, steps involved here, this is an 18 or 19 day procedure requiring three or four operators full time. 
We take uh, blood cells from a healthy donor, we bring them into the laboratory, we grow them in sterile bags, and we feed them, we activate them with antibodies to make them divide. Cells have to divide and be in mitosis for us to get our reagents to work. We add our gene using a viral vector. We then electroporate them. It's a device called electroporator, puts a very high current across cells and allows those molecular scissors, the talon reagents, to get into the cells. And then we grow them in something called a wave bioreactor, and that takes another four or five days. And we collect the cells again, and we wash them, and we deplete them. And eventually, after that 18-day period, we freeze them in doses uh, of um, around about 50 million cells in a single mill in a cryo while, and then they're frozen and sent off for various types of testing. So logistically and technically incredibly challenging all to produce a single product, and it's all done, as I said, ex vivo, not in vivo. But at the end of that, we had a product that we could see in our experiments was very efficacious, was killing all the tumours that we challenged it with. And when we looked using that new technology of uh, uh, high throughput sequencing, we could see very efficient genetic changes at the two sites that we wanted to see them at. That's the, uh, the numbers are, are not that important. We see on the, on the slide on the, uh, on the right, uh, 70 or 80% modification of these cells without any further processing uh, at those two sites. And th this uh, table of numbers basically tells us that when we look at a, a whole list of other sites, we don't see any other modification. So very specific changes to make these cells universal now so we give them to any patient. And we had been planning to start a phase one trial, but taking that through the process of approvals was going to take another year or 18 months. And I had a phone call from a colleague in the hospital who had known we were manufacturing this type of product and asked when it would be ready. Well, I said, well, it's not ready to be used on trial, but we could use our special authority license if we've got enough justification to do that. And this patient hit the headlines at the end of 2015 because she'd been treated already for leukemia. She'd had it since uh, um, a young age of three months. She'd been through a bone marrow transplant. The disease had come back. And really, she was uh, short of uh, any other therapeutic options. And so with various permissions in place, she was treated in uh, June of 2015. And if, if we hadn't have treated her and we'd taken her straight into a bone marrow transplant, this was what we were looking at in terms of her prognosis. In fact, it's the blue line which is if you take a patient back into transplant after a relapse, survival is less than 10%. So uh, we weren't really going to offer that uh, for this child without getting her into what we call a deep molecular emission uh, using these new reagents. So um, the strategy we came up with, knowing there was various caveats about the reagents we had in our hand, was a bridge strategy. So we use a very strong antibody therapy to uh, clear her of her own immunity and um, give the cells. The cells are called UCART, and we use those to eliminate any residual leukemia. And then we delete those cells because we don't really understand what their long term effects might be. And we fill her up using uh, more cells from her bone marrow donor to recover her immune system over a period of uh, several months. So, this is uh, the strategy we came up with. And in fact, this is what happened. This slide, uh, again, you don't need to know the details of this, except to say these two colors, uh, the blue and the orange, are markers of how much disease we can measure by using very sensitive PCR techniques in this child's uh, bone marrow. And we can see on the left that there's uh, high, high amounts of disease even after that first transplant. And it's only after we give the cells, it's called day zero up there, that the disease disappears. And it disappears um, and doesn't come back. It doesn't come back. Uh, right up until the time we do the transplant. And now that's, that slide goes up to 140 days, but we're close to uh, 18 months after that procedure and the measurements are still the same. So nothing has come back. So the potency of the cells is shown by this kind of readout. And we can use other sensitive tests. And again, I don't need to tell you the details of this, but the very sensitive test to measure signatures that the cells have left behind in the blood and we can see over a period of time the cells are detectable in the blood and then they disappear both in the bone marrow and in the peripheral systems. So um, that's um, uh, an experience in one patient. In fact, we treated the second girl shortly afterwards and the two of those are now described in a, in a paper that came out recently. And we're now running a formal phase one trial in children which is sponsored by a drug company 
And that will run over the next uh, 12 or 18 months to treat a further 10 children. And alongside that, there's a trial that's now open at King's College Hospital to treat adult patients with similar types of B-cell leukemia. Uh, and again, it's aiming to treat 10 or 12 patients to uh, determine the uh, safety and effects of this uh, treatment. So um, that's where we are in terms of that first application. But already, things have moved on. In fact, things had moved on by the time we even got close to treating this patient. And um, we know that these applications are coming fast down the track. And the first applications will all be, I'm sure, in somatic systems. By that, I mean we're not talking about editing germline. There will be cell therapies, in particular lymphocyte type of therapies, where we can do ex vivo editing, get cells back. <coughs> they're differentiated cells, so they're not cells that are likely to become cancerous if we change them. The process is done outside the body rather than in the body at the moment, although there are applications we can see coming down the track where there may be gene editing applications for certain tissue in the body, for example, in the back of the eye, uh, where that uh, may, may come to fruition earlier than we thought. Um, and the application we've chosen in the first instance is a time-limited application, not a, not a permanent one, but the permanent ones are coming uh, quite fast too. And there's no doubt that CRISPR will be the uh, platform that's uh, going to come forward with that. So I'll come back to this slide, which shows uh, where we sit in terms of our drive, which is the academic uh, side of things. On the left-hand side of this, we're taking things into phase one type of applications, and we're expecting our partners in companies, biotech, industry, startups to come in and pick them up to take them into the larger phase studies and make uh, licensed treatments out of these in larger phase studies. Uh, and we sit right in the middle in terms of the translational step for this as uh, NHS and universities together. So I think that is the last slide. Um, there's some acknowledgements, obviously, and I'll come back to NIHR as, as the chief uh, support for uh, funding at our institution. Thank you very much.